thank you all for that. And I got so excited thanking John is moved. I forgot to do something very important, and that is John is the one who kind of keeps things together, but there's a staff of a couple of dozen folks or so I've asked to come into this room. Would you all stand up? They're the ones who did this. Come on. Let's give it up for them. name didn't even get in the program book because he came on fairly late, but whose work you're about to see is a young man named Logan Schillinglaw, I think I got that right, Logan Schillinglaw IV, who's been videoing for us, and we want to look for just a second at the video that he has made showing us your great faces, faces and hearing your great words, and after that, Kevin's going to come up and uh, tell us what's next. I am very optimistic and, and hopeful about this space. I see a lot of innovators who are coming up with game-changing ideas and applying um, really new entrepreneurial approaches to old problems. I just see terrific new ideas. I see uh, inspired and inspiring entrepreneurs. Uh, and I see you know, many investors who want to help you know, make their ideas happen. One of the things that's going well is that this concept of how you drive systems change is getting more traction. There's more conversation about what it means to make a difference, not just by investing in one company or even 10 companies that are in a particular area, but how do they relate to each other? How do you know that you're driving systems change? So now I think we're kind of going beyond just sort of uh, ideas and really getting things in the market that have scalability, uh, and real impact on a very large level. So that's been very exciting. Uh, there's also been much more capital freed up in this space as there have been more and more proof points in the market. So I think that's really encouraging. So it's been exciting to see the increasing trend towards effective layering of capital, um, of really applying binoculars to the valley of death and making sure we understand the growth path of social enterprises and even as tonic and early stage network of being able to be really thoughtful about how we can work with other partners up and down to support those enterprises over time. There's quite a lot of adoption that's taken place and the curve has been really steep in a really positive way. Things are happening uh, and people are getting it and buying in with it. It demonstrates that a real market is developing. That social cap capital markets aren't just a concept, uh, but actually becoming a reality. You're seeing the deployment of not just thousands of dollars, or even hundreds of thousands, but literally millions of dollars of capital. So we're seeing a lot of connection. I think that's really what the positive thing is. And that has been really invaluable to me in so many ways, because I work in my loft, in my home, and so many times you're like, how do I fix this problem? <laughs> but when you have the community that says, I've tried and talk tackled it this way. Have you thought about this? So that's been the positive trend that I'm seeing. I think we're doing a great job being a big tent sector. We're bringing in community development organizations in Appalachia and tech investors in Ahmedabad, India, who wouldn't have previously thought of themselves as impact investors. Um, I think that the thousands of people here who either want to work in the sector or have a venture or just trying to figure out what's going on, is, is, it gives me a ton of hope. I see um, a, a lot of new, really interesting and exciting ideas coming up into this space, new approaches for doing things, and really just a paradigm shift in how we're approaching um, some of these old problems. And I think it's going to take that kind of energy, innovation, and passion to, um, uh, to, to change the world. Yeah, Kevin, we know. We turn it off. I mean, we've been watching it for three days now. And I mean, I was speaking to Logan, the videographer, earlier. And he told, hey, Chris, you can turn back Kevin's mic now. OK. So we were, we were talking to, I, I was talking to Logan. And yeah. he kind of told me there was a different story. To There's this. a different story. Yeah, right. another side. Show me the other side. When you There's actually about? a movie. Okay. You want to see the movie? I want to see the movie, yeah. All right. Peter, could you load the other movie? The, do you want the other movie? Yeah, I'm... I'm uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, sure. Right. You tell me when it's ready? Yeah, yeah, it's ready. Yeah. Okay, roll tape. Okay. 
So I have an odd fear uh, and thought about the challenges, and it is that people will not fully grasp the possibility they have. To get where we need to go requires a major acceleration, and it means taking this much more seriously and moving the ball in a much more intent-filled way. The other concern is, um, I don't believe there's proper mechanisms for people to understand how deep their investments are going. And so there's not, the, the feedback channels haven't really been perfected uh, yeah. so that we actually know yeah. where yeah. the money's going and why. Yeah, the thing is, how do you monetize a lot of this stuff? A lot of times I don't even know if monetization of these impacts is even possible. So then what are you going to do? Are you going to accept qualitative measures? Yeah, what makes me fearful is a lot of entrepreneurs say there's no money out there. And a lot of people who want to work in the sector say there are no jobs out there. And a lot of investors say there are no deals out there. And, what we need to do is figure out you, you know, you've, you've got this potential to, to do something in this sector and here's, here's where it is. And I think that, that we're not particularly good at, at making the most of the unbelievable human capital that wants to get involved in the sector. I think one of the biggest challenges, there's still, in my opinion, too much talking and not enough action. Uh, I think it's really important that we're setting the right culture uh, as leaders in this space, a culture that's of, of doers and a culture that's of getting stuff done. And, we need to be thinking beyond ourselves. Uh, there really is a need for more local funding to support our local partners in the market. Uh, so that's something that we're hoping that as we, there's more, more, more and more proof points of these kinds of companies scaling, we're hoping there's more uh, access to local capital for our partners on the ground. My concerns are that scale and investment and the scale of investment in things that happen internationally are very different than they need to be domestically and, and vice versa. And that sometimes, you know, and, and We've got an apple and orange situation and we're trying to talk about these apples and oranges as if they are one and the same, and perhaps they're not. I think one of the greatest challenges is getting to scale. Uh, we have now countless accelerators and incubators, literally hundreds if not thousands of startups, and these startups will now truly be tested. Uh, they've gotten out of the starting block, but now they have to cross the finish line. Right now, we need to scale. Uh, that marketplace. So uh, whether that be through uh, attracting new investment opportunities and new investors into the space. I think it's important to build a community that's honest about what's working and what's not working so we can build a you know, culture that it, it thrives on lessons learned and on moving forward rather than uh, in being quiet about things that aren't working as well as we'd hoped. Um, in order to learn from failure we need yes to be telling stories, but also stories about failure, which are not that common in this space. But we need to collect data in order to know um, the next stepping stone in order to get to that success. And I'm very happy to see in this conference that there is some reflection going on as to whether equity and venture are the best model to really support entrepreneurs. Okay, well, there are multiple sides to the story. Um, I need some help responding to this and talking about where we go next. Rosalie, help me here. What, what do you think we should do? Well, you don't have the answers, do you? I, no, I, I think you know. I just produce conferences. I, think, I don't know. Why don't you get somebody up I, on the I, stage I think, to help I think you? The answers are in the room. I, I think I'm going to call some people up to help me answer these questions and respond to what's happening. Uh, Gaurav Matranja from One Degree Solar, why don't you come up here? And Keely Stevenson, Bamboo. Finance, come up here. Uh, Alex Sloan from uh, Skull Foundation, okay? Tim Further from The Hub, et cetera. Uh, Peter Frickman, come on up. Uh, Majora Carter, okay, you're right there, yeah, right. And Jackie Vanderbilt. So we're bringing down the house. <laughs> okay, so here we are. This is a real place, and yet there's a whole lot of challenges. Uh, what do we do now? What do we do next with all that we've done and all that's in front of us? Uh, Jack, let's start with you. So um, I think, Kevin, we actually all work together, and that's it's some of what you have here, um, you and Rosalie have created. But I'll say the thing that gave me the most hope in the last um, three days was that the message that I wanted to give here that, that gender equality and valuing the skills of women and men and the participation of women and men was actually responded to equally by women and men. So. Yeah, so people hear it. Yeah, 
I mean, what I'll say is, to me, the room was ready for this, and the world is ready. The world is ready for this question of how is it that um, valuing the participation, the experiences, the realities of different genders and the differences of those gets us to more impact and more return. We need the whole population, not half the population, working on these challenges. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Keely, let me ask you next, what do you do now? What are the proof points and what really resonated with you this week? I think, um, I, I'm excited, I think there's been a lot of progress. I, I can resonate with a lot of the challenges. The last five years have been extremely challenging. But the, the progress points, is, the nice thing is, this week I haven't heard anyone talking about sort of definitions of what we're doing, and, and, and you know, in, which is you know, not as useful. But we're, you know, there's metrics, there's standards in place, and there's really great examples of value being created. And in, um, in what we're doing in Bamboo, you know, it, it, there's, we've raised $250 million. Some of those are from institutional investors like pension funds that never really looked at this kind of thing before. There's, there's doors opening you know, around the world. Um, and you know, we're almost placed all of that money in good social enterprises around the world. Um, with the, there's exits happening, one exit, and you know, I, I mentioned earlier when we had a conversation with uh, in a student loan business that we've invested in, we're seeing that there's the default rates for student loans are no different with low-income students in Latin America than they are with middle-income students or higher-income students, and so some of those perceptions of risk that are keeping money from coming into this space in powerful ways and keeping change from happening are, are melting away, I think. And, and it's slow, and it's, you know, and you've got to just roll up your sleeves and, and, and have that patience to, to do it. Um, yeah, that's great. So the risk is, is, the idea of the risk is passing away. Alex Sloan from the Skull Foundation, tell me what you think. So I think we should trust the people in the room here. Mm -hmm. um, if we can't get it done with these folks, then we're doomed. But um, I have a lot of sense of optimism about it. Um, my suggestion is that we each find our place, um, that we measure what we're doing, that we share our knowledge, um, and that we manage expectations. Um, I have been through other cycles of investing before, as many of us have, and to overpromise uh, is a very bad thing as an entrepreneur, also as an investor. Uh, I have told more than a few of my limited partners or investors things that I didn't deliver on. And so I think managing the expectations of how much time it will take, what the risk is, what the actual return is going to be, is a very important thing for us to be rigorous with and honest about so we don't blow this in one cycle. Right. So perceptions of risk are passing away, but we know that it takes a long time. We know that it takes a long time. Peter, you're an entrepreneur. Tell me about what you're doing and why it matters. Sure. So. Um my company, Drip Tech, makes affordable drip irrigation for small plot farmers in developing countries. Um, we've been making progress over the last couple of years. I think, you know, look, listening to that video, uh, you know, one of the concerns uh, that was that was issued resonates with me about you know local capital for our distribution partners. But at the same time, it's one of the topics that we've actually made the most progress on at this conference. You know, talking about how to leverage progress at this conference, at okay. this particular conference. So Good. you know, you know, there will always be problems, and these and these challenges that that, that are identified are, are real challenges. But I mean, that's why we're here, right? Right. At convening to make that progress. Okay. Great. Majora, tell me what hope you have and what you see as the road ahead. Um, for me, it was really helpful to be here and and get a chance to talk to a bunch of folks and realize that folks were kind of on the same page, that a lot of things really weren't working, and that there was time for a change. And just that acknowledgement that maybe there are different ways that we could apply capital to really support people, um, you know, I think in particular domestically, was something that you know, really speaks uh, volumes to me, and I was really excited to hear that there was a, an opportunity for people to recognize that so that we can create models to move forward on it. Yeah, great, thank you. Yorav, tell me about what you see. Sure, Kevin. Um, I actually come from the traditional aid and development community. So I studied development in school. I went on to work for a nonprofit, uh, did international healthcare work in post conflict Liberia for a few years. And I think there are many lessons learned from other uh, investing industries and also from the traditional.
from other, <laughs> excuse me, from other, that wasn't for dramatic, dramatic effect, but uh, other industries in the US, but also I think why we're all here and we all are here in order to generate um, real change and impact in these other countries or within our own communities. And um, in, in Liberia, we ended up raising, can everyone hear me if I keep going? Okay. So while in Liberia, we ended up raising quite a bit of money, um, millions of dollars for uh, solar energy for health clinics. We had patients showing up at clinics who couldn't be seen after dark. Uh, they didn't have any electricity. Um, childbirth, uh, car accidents, anything, whatever you had, you just couldn't be helped. And uh, all these millions of dollars were used for solar and due to impassable roads and lack of uh, planning and, and other resources, we just couldn't address this problem and ended up leaving uh, the not only Liberia, but the traditional uh, development industry and started a company, uh, One Degree Solar. We, <laughs> we, so One Degree Solar, we, <laughs> I only have 90 seconds, but this is, this is kind of, so One Degree Solar actually manufactures very low cost solar energy uh, devices that provide lighting, phone charging, and other um, power to not only clinics, um, schools, entrepreneurs, etc. but we can do this for hundreds of thousands of dollars of private investment, um, many, most of which actually we received in, in equity through investors that we met at conferences like this, actually at SOCAP last year. And I think that's what we can all, all learn here is that you can raise millions in, in grant funding from multilaterals and from the traditional aid community um, and actually have a faster, longer term, more sustainable impact in these countries with private investment. And I just want to thank the, the conveners for bringing us all together and making this possible. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. And so, I, I think you said you, 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 you think you'd lined up something uh, at, at this conference that is the funding to go forward. Yeah, okay, great. Tim, we've been working together a long time. Tell me what you see and what makes you go forward. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I mean, at this, <clears throat> I'd say uh, at this conference, Kevin, um, I am continually amazed by just the sheer on-ramping of talent. Uh, I think uh, Ross Baird in the, in the video said this uh, quite, quite passionately, but uh, and, and in that is a real, I, I think, a real challenge to the space uh, that we need to not just talk about and nurture and develop our financial capital in, and instruments and, you know, layer and all this stuff, but we really need to have a great deal of respect and um, stewardship and sort of development of our, of our human capital, our people, and, uh, but it's amazing. I mean, like the, and I see this at the Hub every day. It's one of my, kind of my pet passions, and where Impact Assets works out of uh, in San Francisco and, you know, a community of 1,200 um, often young uh, uh, social entrepreneurs and innovators that are, um, that are just springing up all over the world in 30 cities already, going probably to 300 cities in the next five years. And there's just an amazing amount of, of, um, of resources. I, I think that, um, that that gives me a lot of hope. I, I, the way the DNA is shifting, and, and maybe it's a generational thing, a sort of millennial, you know, uh, epoch that's coming at us. And then you know, sort of the dark side of that, some people may have heard me say, is that it's kind of like maybe my change, my theory of change is like wait for us to die, you know. <laughs> and that's sort of like, well, what do you want to do about okay. the pension funds? Uh, well, wait, we literally just wait for the the blockage to get pushed out of the system and. I know that doesn't sound like a positive, hopeful thing, but time is on our side as long as we can also deal with the fact that the, the poverty and climate change and everything else is about to fall off a cliff and we have to be incredibly impatient. So that balancing act uh, and the way that I see that progressing is, um, is, is kind of where my mind is at right now. Yeah, great. Who else? Yeah, go ahead, Alex. So, 
so one thing I've been incredibly impressed by is the, the diversity of the group that comes here and how, how more and more people that you would not expect, uh, organizations represented that you would not expect are showing up here and in other gatherings around impact, whether it's with a for-profit or a non-profit point of view. I think we're beginning to drop some of the barriers between traditional funding sources and entrepreneurs and technology and development people and whether we need to be patient or get the hell on with it, I think it's probably the latter. Um, you're, you're right though. So I'm, I'm encouraged by the collaboration that's possible and that's what, at Skull Foundation, we're really trying to collaborate as much as we can. We've been working with social entrepreneurs our whole existence in 1999, so that's easy. We've done a partnership recently with USAID, so we're actually working with the US government trying to co-fund social entrepreneurs with innovative solutions around the world. We have co-funding partnerships with major co-funders and other foundations, for-profit and non-profit. And we're not inventing this, we're just trying to, to model it and, and to do it as well. But I think there's a lot to be learned from each other. And if we can drop some of the uh, traditional reasons to not work together, there's a lot of hope. Um, and if, I think social entrepreneurs are the only way we're gonna get anywhere in the world. And so we have to fund them and support them and, and get this done. Okay, right. Majora, what resonated with you? you? You've talked about, you know, you're new to the, coming to this kind of gathering. You've done greening of the Bronx forever, but what really resonated with you? What, what did you see here? What is new here for you? Well, I'm actually not new to coming to conferences like this at all. Okay. Um, and uh, what is interesting to me is that, listen, the, um, the revolution may not be televised, but it definitely needs to be funded. And I do think that, again, what I heard here and what I often actually had heard at a lot of different um, conferences like this was that there wasn't, didn't seem to be such, there seemed to be a lot of like, yes, we're really interested in um, you know, supporting the needs of, of people domestically, but I didn't really see a lot of action come out of that. You know, what I'm hoping that comes out of this one in particular is an, an acknowledgement that, you know, poverty does exist right here in America and that we need to be supportive of ways that actually really do restore and build our communities in ways that they haven't, you know, before. And um, that's what I'm hoping, and that's what I've certainly heard from many of the individual conversations that I've had with lots of people that this is, an, this is, this is real and that folks understand that and that you know, and it's you know, figuring out ways to, to fund the, you know, the folks that are really doing work in communities and domestically is really important. Yeah, okay, thanks. Somebody else want to add what resonated for them during this week? One more thing. Yeah. So what resonated for me um, was the power and watching people take ideas of using a gender lens into all kinds of different sectors and different places. So uh, I, I've given gender lens talks at this conference for three years now. They've always been in a breakout session and um, I think the number of men usually was somewhere between three and six. Um, and so having that conversation in the main stage and then watching it go throughout the entire conference and so we were talking about, sure, we were talking about menstruation, we were talking about uh, family planning, but we were talking about funding them with investment dollars. And then we were also talking about energy, and we were talking about food, and we were talking about the role that men and women play on that, and how do we reduce the barriers, and how do we see things. So I had people coming back to me and saying, oh, this is really great, because this came up in my session here, and we thought about it differently than we had before. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's another years. version yeah. of the mainstreaming. And I think the systems conversation is the same thing. It's like, instead of that just being a um, panel breakout, it comes in and across everything, which again, the, the workshops that you guys did, I think allowed that, the, the going deep and then mainstreaming. Yeah. yeah. I'm, <laughs> I think, I think, go ahead. What do you have? One of the things that Kevin and I talk about a lot is that he really looks at things from a systemic perspective, and I tend to look at the things for the individual. And um, I don't know whether Kathy's in the room or not, and I don't really want to, shouldn't have singled her out, but at our last staff meeting before we uh, opened the doors for all of you to join us, she nearly um, lost it. She just started going, we got to do this, 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 and she's like, there's no end in sight. I don't think I can get everything done. And when I look at the problems that y'all look at every day, there's no end in sight. How do you keep going? What's your personal story about how you keep going? <laughs> I 
Um, stand up. It's, yeah, stand it's, up it's a great question because at the end of the day, this community is made up of individuals with their own energy and their own passions and their own sense of, of hope. And then when you you know look around the world at some of the things we're trying to do, and you see maybe a or the thing a woman who's having the trade off of food for her kids or medicine and you know to pay for those things it's it's it can be hopeless it can be hard and it's also just hard rigorous work every single day but at the same time um, it's intellectually stimulating it's fun and there's so much personal energy out of just meeting each individual and understanding their story and their relationships um, and I think for me the uh, the kind of ability to have the resilience and keep going, even though you see things are, you know, it's long-term uh, change that we're going to have comes from um, just knowing that uh, stranger things have happened. <laughs> In the sense that why not? Why, why shouldn't we be putting our life force into things that are meaningful with people that we care about? Um, I, I spent uh, quite a number of years doing hospice volunteer work, and that really shaped the way I think about things. So a couple of hours um, a week I would spend in people's homes who had terminal illnesses, and they would share these amazing stories with me about their lives, uh, essentially, you know, things they regretted, things they wished they hoped they had done, but also things they were really proud of. And so much of what I saw here this week about where people are spending their time and, and why people are continuing to do this, uh, whether it's been 15 years or they just started a couple of weeks ago, is, is around that. It's wanting that your life to have a, a meaning, a purpose, and to contribute to something greater in this world. And I think that's what keeps me going. And uh, a friend told me the other day that really great entrepreneurs have a sort of dual ability in their brains to, uh, to do two things. One is be extremely impatient and upset and sometimes angry at the way things are. So it was going to be sort of the, the second part of that video. <laughs> um, and at the same time, be really grateful and appreciative and have gratitude for the way things um, are and where things have come and the people around them. And I think for me that that gratitude is what keeps me going and that, that beauty and that potential of, of what's possible. Um, so thank you. Well said. What a great answer. Thank you. Anyone else want to try that one? Here. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, it's absolutely true that the tasks that we have in front of us are daunting. And from an entrepreneurial perspective, it really it can be very solitary. And so from the perspective of, you know, what keeps you going? How do you, how do you kind of look into the abyss and, you know, keep trudging along? I say I, I think there's kind of two two aspects to that. One is um, the impact. You know, now we're starting to see impact. And I, I live in India. I live and I and I work. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the field with our customers. So seeing the impact is an important part of, of of staying energized. And even just this conference is the second part of being energized in this type of conference because community is important. If you're in a very solitary role, even if you have a team and even if you're leading that team. You still need compatriots and you still need community and you need support and the type of recharge and re refresh and, and re-energy that, that you get at a, at a conference like this if you're an entrepreneur, three manic days of connecting with people and seeing what they're working on and, and giving them your ideas and getting their ideas, I think that that is an important part of, of of managing your psychology as, a, as an entrepreneur and against these types of, you know, dauntless tasks. So that's, that's kind of how I manage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Similar to Peter's comment, I think the, the actual change on the ground, when, when you see that, it makes the the solitary confinement sort of uh, <laughs> a bit more bearable, but I mean, I've been doing, I've been an entrepreneur for uh, three years now, three, a bit more, and um, very much, I, I, I think the, I think where we are now it, as a company and where I am now as a person is really just a, result of not stopping. I mean, there were certainly times, there have been times in the past where I'm sure we've all wanted to stop, um, 
a big deal fell through, um, somebody quit, uh, you can't pay rent. <laughs> you know, you, there are other opportunities out there, and I think when when it's at the end of the day, in traction means something different to us, where that means one extra customer, and and it's important to not consider them beneficiaries, but these are people who are making the decision and um, using their purchasing power to improve their lives. So every additional customer we have and that traction that people in this room like to see and, and, and um, what matters um, to more traditional investors, I think, makes a big difference to us because we can actually go to the field and, and see those farmers or see our households or see the entrepreneurs selling these products and, and hear their stories. And I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, the second quick thing is the excitement of, of uh, these conferences and this every interaction because we are small and nimble and can um, decide and react and implement very quickly as opposed to a much larger, larger organization or corporation, et cetera. So we have, a, we have a conversation in the hallway, for example, at this sort of conference and next week we can start working on it, if it makes sense. And I think that sort of opportunity. Uh, I mean, these are, we've all, we've all heard the numbers, you know, 1.3 billion without power, 2.5 billion, I mean, all the issues are, are huge. And I think the more interactions we have and more ideas that are actually exchanged, it makes it more exciting because it, they're still out there. There hasn't been an idea that has truly scaled and wiped out these problems. So let's keep talking. And it's been three days of talking, but it's clearly not enough because these issues are still out there. So. Thank you. Thank you. This has been great. One, anyone else want to say one more thing? Majora? Um, Stand up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can do it. I don't know who started that, but whatever. Um, look, I'm a very blessed woman, and I know it. You know, I'm from a particular American ghetto, but there are ghettos all over this country. That's what keeps me going. Mm. Um, you know, I would like to think that what I heard, what, what, I, what I said, and what, what I heard coming back to me from folks was not just that I was just, this happened to be this inspirational speaker that you heard, but that I was actually a woman with a plan, you know, for how to change, you know, pieces of this world that desperately need it. So that's what keeps me going, because I could have been, I could have had a very, very different fate than the one that I had. And so for that, that is the reason why I will come to places like this and give you ways in which you can invest your dollars and so that you really create the kind of change that you know is possible in our lifetimes. That's what keeps me going. And I'm sure that's what keeps the rest of us going up here too because we're trying to create some change and could use a little help doing so. Okay.